All right, welcome everybody to the 7th of May. This is the Open Research Institute's FPGA meetup. And what we talk about is what we've done over the past week, what we have planned for the next week, um, whether or not we have any roadblocks and if we need any resources. Uh, and there's a lot going on. So I'll hand it right over to, to Paul to talk about anything with remote labs and what he's uh, been up to. Hello. Um... I don't think I have anything to report this week. <laughs> All right, that's good. Things have been working good. Um, a bunch of us have been using the lab, and I don't think we've had any any uh, any issues at all. I know I uh, said it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay, and then I'll hand it over to Ken to talk about uh, his progress. Um, yeah, let's see, um, I went back to the, uh, to kind of basics with the, uh, the polyphase filter and looked at the specs of the uh, analog devices transceiver and it was going to be quite a bit of work to, uh, to put the, um, uh, Put it, put it in like a 40 megahertz mode. So it kind of dug into the specs a little more. And uh, yeah, it looks like there is in fact a, a way to program it in an error band down to I think even five megahertz, but should should be able to do the 10 megahertz directly. So it's going to save a lot of uh, front end interpolation and yeah, make it a simpler should should basically just hook up as is right now. So that that's good news. Um, let's see. Um, I installed some tool chain to configure the transceiver, and I think that's that's pretty much it. I did one other thing too. I'm trying to forget. Okay, if it comes to me, I'll remember. But that's. <laughs> Understand completely. All right, I have a report from uh, from Matthew, and this is on uh, Opulent Voice, and he reports that the let's see, hang on. Okay, sorry, had some audio challenges here. Okay, so the next report is is from Matthew. He unfortunately can't join up today at this meeting, but he's. He's um he has some reports from from Opulent Voice. The MSK or minimum shift keying modulator and demodulator are working, and the demodulator includes a symbol clock recovery logic. The carrier synchronization logic is is mostly present. Um, so the parts that aren't there yet are the error data switch and the low pass filters. In other words, the simulation is assuming perfect synchronization, which uh, that's a, a very common place from, from where we start. Um, so he switched over to the, the Massey. Uh, so we're, we've been working with the Hodgart Massey uh, version of the modulator and demodulator. And he switched over to that. Um, Massey's demodulator is largely used in the Hodgart and, and Shuni's demodulator. Um, where they add a costus loop for carrier recovery as well as for symbol timing recovery. And, and he explains that, that they also rearranged some terms and used a, a different differential encoding scheme. Uh, so differential encoding is used in, in this particular class of, of uh, communications in order to resolve a 180 degree phase am ambiguity issue. Uh, so that's, a, that's something that, that all of these designs assume. We talked about that uh, briefly last week. Anyway, the further updates about Opulent Voice, which is our uplink um, uh, digital communications um, method, uh, it's a it's coming along. Um, and so we've been working on this, uh, this, uh, this uplink, uh, I'll say standard, although we don't yet have a standards document for it, but the implementations and experimentation to kind of get this working and demonstrated over the air is proceeding uh, on several fronts. So uh, Paul has been uh, very involved with the general purpose processor 
implementation for the University of Puerto Rico's sounding rocket uh, experiment. And this uses the 4ARI FSK version. Uh, we went from a 4ARI FSK uh, to a minimum shift keying. Uh, the minimum shift keying implementation is what Matthew is discussing. So if you want to see all of the, the updates and how things are progressing, then please join the Opulent Voice channel on our Slack. And there's uh, plenty more to, to do there. Uh, so, so it's not just about uh, progressing from the four four area FSK to minimum shift keying, uh, but also to continue with the general purpose processor Raspberry Pi based implementation, um, where the the latest sort of innovation or step forward is to is to simplify the design and to uh, reduce some of the dependencies. For example, GNU Radio. So, uh, GNU Radio is extremely useful, very good prototyping tool, but being able to to you know, set that aside or eliminate that as a requirement. Uh, simplifies the design, makes it a little easier to use and deploy. Um, and, and Matthew and me and a few others have been working on a FPGA implementation of this communications protocol. And the success that Matthew is reporting is is a RTL implementation. And so he has some waveforms and some some results. So this will also continue. And uh, yeah, so lots of activity there. The target for the for the opulent voice has been the Pluto SDR. Uh, we got an email from from Carrie Banky uh, with some suggestions for for how to uh, deal with the the Pluto SDR. So those are very appreciated. And I'll I'll put those in the opulent voice channel. And all right, anything else? Um, I don't have anything to report on on Neptune for the week. Uh, I was at the the World Microwave Congress, um, which is a IEEE uh, conference of uh, MTTS or Microwave Theory and Technology Society put it on. This was an excellent virtual event. It did have some uh, UAV or drone content, uh, and that's over in the Neptune channel. The artificial intelligence content I put in the AI channel, and then the rest of it was in general. So that turned out to be a a really cool conference to go to. It was well worth the time. That's where I spent uh, four uh, mornings <laughs> uh, sitting in on on various uh, things. So there's some quantum and some 6G content as well. There's lots of overlap with what we're doing on FCC TAC. All right, I think that's it. Uh, does anybody need anything? Does anybody not have any resource that they need that I can work on uh, or a roadblock that they're suffering from? I think we're in pretty good shape. I think this is one of those weeks where we know what we're doing more or less and are moving forward and, and haven't had uh, significant problems. So then the next step for Neptune, the drone uh, physical layer link that we're working on is to integrate the data side so we have uh, OFDM data that's being produced in Simulink, and we have some some rough drafts of HDL code for that. And we also have a what it, it's a, a fairly complicated or involved uh, preamble uh, construction. Um, and so there's three phases to the preamble. There's an AGC burst preamble A, uh, which is two tones, uh, two sinusoid tones, and then a another Zadoff Chu. Uh, preamble. So the, the Zadoff Chu for the AGC verse as well. And so, uh, oh, and there's also a, uh, a choice of length of the preamble in the middle, preamble A. Um, and so that's been sorted out and, and is in a fairly decent state right now, but those two set chunks of the transmitter are not connected yet. So the next step is to, to do the control circuitry for when you press push to talk, all of these preambles come out and then it shifts over to data. And right now that it is just random data, uh, there's no resource grid yet uh, in here. Um, and we do have a lot of talking to do about whether or not to, to proceed with the developing FlexLink standard, uh, which has uh, taken some, some, has had a big increase in, in uh, complexity recently, or to just do a simplified 
a more simplified approach that's tuned to five gigahertz, which is the band of interest for us. Um, on the Neptune front, we have uh, meetings coming up with some other uh, drone groups. Um, we've done some outreach here and tried to figure out what other people are doing. And we have a, uh, a basic requirements effort uh, for five gigahertz to try to figure out what the right choices are. Uh, for for things like subcarrier spacing, bandwidth, to look at the band plan, and some progress there has been made. So that's that's all published in the repository. All right. Anything else? Let me say a few words about what I've been up to on the uh, with your help and on the software implementation of of the old style opulent voice. Um. My my goal now is to try to make that a usable piece of software so that you could actually deploy it and do something useful with it in the hopes that, that this will be useful to the Puerto Rico people and maybe somebody else. Uh, what we have now, working both here and in Puerto Rico, is a is a demo that can send a file, which could be voice or it could be voice. And it can also do a bit error rate test mode. Um that's not really a radio you could drop into a, a mission unless all your mission is doing is playing a file. So I wanted to integrate a front end to the data input side that could take voice, but also take IP data and maybe some other things that we could imagine as being part of a more fully deployed system. And those include the authentication or 5A uh, data that we talked about a couple of years ago in, in some detail, which has to, uh, has the interesting property that it might have to actually happen during the voice transmission. If the, if the advanced payload that we'd be talking to on a mission like high wanted to authenticate the voice transmission and decide whether to permit it or not. Um, and possibly some kind of integrated chat facility where you're talking like in a zoom call Imagine that. And you also want to exchange some small pieces of text, maybe a, a URL or, or something, or just insert something without interrupting the, the voice conversation. So uh, real-time chat uh, on top of voice or inter, intermix with voice somehow. And so I I created a, a state machine design that would, in text, that would uh, go into the the opulent voice code haven't implemented the code yet, but I on the way to with this design and uh, Michelle took that and created a state diagram and some had some feedback for me on, on how that should work. And the open question or the question in, uh, in discussion right now is whether it makes any sense for a chat to actually override voice or whether it should be pending until the voice drops and then go through. Um, I think there's arguments for both and maybe make it switchable. That's more complexity than either of the ones by itself. So I don't want a lot of extra complexity. I'd rather have something that is reliable and works, but we could have both with a little more extra work. So that's where that's at. Um, my next step is going to be to integrate. Uh, there's the state diagram on the, that Michelle has drawn very pretty. Um, well, getting prettier, it was, uh, it'll be, it'll, it'll continue to, uh, to evolve. Yeah. It's, it's got a nice, maybe more symmetry in the diagram than it, than it has in, in function. If you, if you look at the text descriptions, it's a little more irregular, but there are several different states you can be in, um, and lots of different kinds of feedback because you have multiple different data sources all being multiplexed. And the, I should clarify, this is not supposed to be a change to the standard. The standard still allows you to multiplex these things however you want. Um, this is intended to be a, an implementation proposal. This is, this is one way to do uh, data multiplexing on the front end and the, the way I'm planning to go implement. And I'm hoping it'll be easy. Um, so we'll be able to go from working with files to working with more real-time data um, that'll require some additional work, like implementing push to talk, um, but not not a huge amount of of extra stuff to do. 
Um, so that's, I just want to present that in case anybody has strong feelings or, uh, if anybody has a little spare time to go look at the document that I put out, it's in the repo in the draft form prior to Michelle's review and the diagram as well. Uh, if you want to have some input to that, now's the time. Go and read it. Tell me what you think. Uh, Slack is the best place for that discussion to happen. So, yeah, I think all. both the both the document and the diagram are, have been or drafts have been put on put on Slack, and and this is this is exciting because we've been talking about this uh, opulent voice being, um, you know, sort of integrating both both voice and data without a clunky separate packet mode. And we've been talking about it for a while. So we hope that that this is proof of the of the effort that it that it is taking in order to to make a, a proof of concept or a demonstration of that uh, uh, come into reality. And so we've, we've learned a lot. There's there's things that are only revealed when you we actually do try to to go and implement it. So so that's the goal of this particular body of work. Um, that, that's right. And the interesting the thing that makes this a problem and not just something you go ahead and do is that we've very carefully optimized the, the whole protocol around the needs of our 16 kilobit data mo uh, voice mode. Uh, there's just enough room in the packet in the frame in the 40 millisecond transmit frame for one voice packet and it's overhead. Uh, so if you're sending voice and you don't want to accept any voice uh, degradation, which we don't, then there's no room for data. So ways to change that uh, in a way that doesn't degrade the, the voice performance uh, very much and then automatically expands to all data when the voice user lets go of the microphone and stops talking uh, is what we're talking about here. Yeah, this is an exercise in applying quality of service with respect to user expectations from an amateur uh, radio point of view. And it's uh, been good so far. This is uh, not something that you see in other uh, in any of the commercial products. So the the way that that it's done uh, for for things like AC System Fusion or uh, D Star is is that you you have a separate mode. Uh, I'm most familiar with the way AC System Fusion does it. Uh, so it's either going to be a separate channel for for data uh, or a separate appliance uh, completely, such as the the camera microphone. So what we're trying to do here is make it a lot more seamless and to 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 to, to leverage uh, the the fairly large number of uh, of application layer uh, tools that we have. Um, since this is all TCP/IP RDP, um, you know that you can you can have a, a lot of flexibility and power at the application layer and and still preserve the high fidelity voice uh, going through. So integrating voice and data on the same channel with quality of service and and prioritizing is is what you see here. So it'd be yeah, look, good to get this uh, demonstrated early and often and and find out where it fails and and uh, see if our assumptions about about how often we can puncture the voice uh, come through. Yeah, that's right. And luckily, uh, this is a very small subset of the quality of service problem because we assume, or I'm assuming for now anyway, that the user terminal that's doing this multiplexing on the transmit side is the last and only place where we need to worry about it. That after we send through our little narrow pipe up to the, to the satellite, that it'll be able to demultiplex and has plenty of downlink bandwidth to support everything. So really it's just a management, managing that one link that's completely under our control so it doesn't have any negotiation, doesn't have any modes, doesn't have any protocols. It's just make some decisions and send some packets out, which is the easy part of QoS. Yeah. Sometimes constraining the problem is uh, is half the battle. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I wanted to circle back a little bit and and just emphasize um, the the achievements on Opulent Voice are uh, are, are are really good lately. Uh, and a special thank you for to Matthew for the hard work on the the FPGA implementation and the MSK. Having worked through this in Simulink and uh, attempted to implement some of these 
uh, extremely interesting uh, ways to, to do um, digital communications. Uh, minimum shift keying is not like the others. Um, it's been been a tremendously uh, good learning experience for for all of us. Uh, uh, so there's been multiple people that have benefited from this, and and, uh, and Matthew's uh, breakthrough and and him spearheading a, a, a working implementation is going to pay off, uh, both in terms of, of a demonstration and a proof of concept, but also to to illustrate uh, what is a really really cool. Uh, modulation and and digital communications technique. Uh, Matthew also found a paper that that describes uh, MSK. You can view it not just in the two ways that we know. You know, you see the traditional sort of IQ uh, modulation for for minimum shift keying, um, but it can also be looked at as a sort of uh, offset QPSK. So this is a, a you can look at it as a QPSK technique. Uh, but there's three other ways to look at it, and it and all of them illuminate uh, sort of a different aspect of digital communications. So, so in terms of like fulfilling an educational mission, I think we are <laughs> we are doing a really good job here. Uh, so once you kind of embrace a, a bit of a steep learning curve on this, and and kind of it's, it's, you have a similar experience over on Neptune with OFDM, um, you know, so so OFDM is different than some of the traditional uh, ways of, of communicating and, and modulating and organizing information. Um, so as we press forward, uh, we are sort of making a commitment and following through on um, describing it in in maybe more accessible terms. Um, and, and to that end, we, over the past week, um, we, we signed the the uh, all the paperwork for the two uh, articles from from Neptune to be published in QEX. So we'll have a, a Zadoff Chu article explaining you know what it is and why you want to use it and how it's used on Neptune. And we have another article about space frequency block coding, what it is, why you want to use it, how we implement it, what it gets you uh, on Neptune. And so we anticipate uh, at least two or three articles from recent work on uh, opulent voice to also uh, come out of that work and to to provide a way for people to have an accessible sort of starting point. So if you're interested in this and and want to learn more, um, you know, our, we're, we're here to make it as, as easy as possible. Um, things worth doing are rarely easy and digital communications has, has lots of prerequisites and, and it's, very interdisciplinary and can have us can have a steep learning curve, but our commitment is to make it as easy as possible. And and so we've carried through with a lot of that over the past couple of weeks. Having said that, we have our work cut out for us. So the next documentation day, it's every Friday. Uh, we'll it's going to be a busy day for us. <laughs> so looking forward to that. Yeah, and, and thank you uh, to Paul for for. Uh, putting all of this on paper because we've been talking about it for a while, but there's nothing quite like actually going and, and doing it and writing it down. Um, and there's been a, been a couple of revisions with some, some shifts uh, and what you've seen on screen today may, may not be what exactly what you see in a couple of weeks. It'd be really nice to have this working at DEF CON um, and, and in the autumn. So, all right, that's it. That's it for me. Any other subjects or topics before we close the recording? All right. Thanks, everybody. This is great. And we'll meet, uh, if all goes well, we'll meet next week. And if you're, uh, and of course, uh, all the daily engineering will be on Slack and updates to the list. Okay. So I'll close the recording now. And thanks, everybody.